Good morning and War Eagle, even though that was a tough loss last night. Um, we, we are yet strong in the War Eagle family, in the Auburn family. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, this is gonna be a wonderful day of reflection um, and just really fellowship. And, and I'm so excited that we have this opportunity to be together and, um, and just thinking back over the whole week and all the things that we've been able to learn and um, participate in. I'm just very grateful for all of you to be there. Um, and also, I just want to thank the Auburn Alumni Association and my family in the Office of Alumni Affairs for all of their support and help throughout this week, as well as my alumni um, uh, who have also supported and been at all of our events and programs. So we want to start it off today with a little selection from the AU Gospel Choir. Let me make sure. Here we go.
All right. War Eagle, War Eagle, War Eagle. Happy Sunday, everybody. What an awesome, awesome week we've had as we've reconnected virtually, as we've made this Black Alumni Week happen, even during a pandemic. My name is Nathaniel Rutledge Jr. And uh, I'm a 1990 graduate uh, in criminology and a 2016 master's graduate in justice and public safety. Uh, I'm just excited just for this opportunity. I want to take a quick moment before I get into my little uh, comments and just say thank you to our president, Jay Goose, to uh, Gretchen Van Valkenburg, to Regina Sanders, and especially Aaron Hutchins and the AU Maine. We're just thankful for you guys making this virtual celebration happen. Who knew? Who knew that Zoom could be so cool? Today, we want to hopefully inspire somebody and get people excited about just how good it is to be an Auburn Tiger and just how good it is to be a believer in God. You know, Joshua, the fourth chapter, shared a story, very familiar story, that's going to be the theme of what we share today. And it basically says, when Joshua was, re was ready to lead the Israelites across the Jordan River to enter the land the Lord had promised them so many years ago, God said to him, choose 12 men from among you, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. And so Joshua called together the 12 and said, each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder to serve as a sign among you. And in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that these stones are to be a memorial. Now, perhaps during this week, you've, you've, there's an item or there's a memory or there's a person during your Auburn experience that serves as a reminder of something special that God did for you. Did he help you get through your classes? Did he help you get to an opportunity? Did he help sustain you through life? Maybe something that was shared in presentations. We learned a lot about Major Harper and Betsy Scott and Pebble Hill Legacy, about Robert Frazier, our mascot, and James Eccles and his Tuma's Lemonade, about Greek life and the Divine Nine, or maybe you were inspired when you saw your fellow classmates in the 2020 Black Alumni Week recipients of awards, or maybe even you were encouraged by young Kenneth Reese III, the first African-American 4-H president. So as I thought all week about the stones that God has graced me with all through my journey at Auburn, which has continued through my life, and why I'm so proud that even my children have chosen Auburn, I'm reminded of simple things like the Arboretum, where I could go over and look at the flowers and had sanctuary. I think about little old St. Luke CME Church right there on Donahue next to the railroad track. I think about people like Yvonne Scott who used to feed all the football players or Carlin Brown who would give us a job because she knew we didn't have no money. Or even Brother Chet, Brother Chet Williams who always reminded me that life was so much bigger than football. I think we needed that reminder after last night. And then even my roommate, Irvin McCoy, who had a terrible accident that left him a quadriplegic, and I had to be his personal care until he got out of college. And then, of course, that Auburn University gospel choir. When I was a freshman on campus, I was searching to figure out what's my purpose and what's my niche. And one day I wandered myself on over to the Baptist Student Union. And I was about to walk out when I could hear the clamor of a piano. Somebody was playing down in the basement. And I went down and I found Laura Pope 
Ligon mastering an old, beat up, toe down piano. Uh, and a couple of people were trying to sing along with her. The keys were sticking, the foot pedal was getting hung up, but still that sound was kind of mesmerizing. I joined in and we sang, I shall wear a crown. And then a little bit later, we sang, what he's done for me. And soon the word got out that we were practicing and everybody started saying, we want you to come to our church. We want you to come to our civic organization. We want you to come and be a part of Auburn University. That was when we formed the Auburn University Gospel Choir. I was so excited because we went into a practice space and we had a piano where the keys worked properly, where the pedals didn't get stuck. And we were in Goodwin Hall. We had fine blue robes on uh, with an orange AUGC monogrammed on white stoves. We had a new director. Dr. Claude Gossett Jr., God rest the soul of Papa G. And the choir performed on campus. It performed in the legislature. It performed at churches all through the Southeast and beyond. This is what I want you to know about my stone. My stone of the gospel choir ministered to my soul. It took a little knucklehead 18, 17, 18, 19 year old kid and reminded me just how good God had been to me, even though I was away from my mom and my daddy and I was trying to do my own thing. It was a safe haven where I could worship and I could exalt the name of Jesus. It was my family because sometimes uh, the campus of Auburn was a foreign land. You know, to be one of 487 out of nearly 19,000 students, uh, that wasn't a big number. And I know some of you were there even before then, but it was a constant reminder of why I never shall forget just what the Lord has done for me. Auburn University Choir, that's my stone, the stone that got me over the Chili Jordan. Next up, my colleague say. Good morning, everybody in Warrior. Eagle. I guess it's afternoon in Georgia, but morning in Alabama. I live in Warner Robins, Georgia. Um, again, my name is Sonia Jenkins. I'm a 1992 COSAM graduate with an applied mathematics degree. And um, to echo my brother, Nate, thank you to everyone involved with making Black Alumni Week such a special, special week of aha moments and stones that we were able to, to look at and, and observe and and say, gosh, I didn't know that. And, and just like in the book of Joshua, where God instructed Joshua to instruct the tribes of Israel to, hey, grab a stone, set it up. And when people ask you what this is, this is what you tell them. Well, well, what were they supposed to tell them? Well, God had already worked miraculous works in the lives of the children of Israel. And um, this particular memorial was set up because they were preparing to cross over the River Jordan and a lot of us know the story about God parting the Red Sea and the children of Israel going through and Pharaoh's army got drowned in the Red Sea. But a similar thing happened right here at the River Jordan, where as they were preparing to cross, God parted the River Jordan and it sat up according to the word as a heap. So imagine two walls and the people just walking on through on the other side of the River Jordan into the promised land that God had promised them years and years and years and, and even generations back. And so they were to say, hey, look what God has done for us. We set up these memorial stones for people to look back. People generations after the Jordan gets parted and gets put back and, and is flowing again. So that generations after that miraculous work that God had done would know who God is and what he had done in their lives. And so similarly for us as Auburn alums, there are stones that have already been set up that have inspired us. I know this entire week was filled with inspirational moments for me. The ahas that I experienced with some of the videos, the things that I just flat didn't know. I think unanimously, we can probably say that we all know who Harold Franklin is and the date 1964. As a COSAM graduate, I didn't know who Samuel Pettijohn was, uh, Dr. Samuel Pettijohn, first COSAM graduate, undergraduate. Just so many stones 
that we have a responsibility to ask, what does that mean? If you're in the College of Nursing, do you know who your first black graduate was? If you're in the School of Forestry, do you know who your first black graduate is? So the responsibility is not just on the teachers, that it says when the children ask in time. So those who may not know, it's incumbent upon us to ask, to find out, and not just be satisfied with the 12 stones, but what stone are you going to leave? And I submit for me, one of the things that I, I attempt to leave as a legacy, and I pray that you leave as a legacy, is confidence. Now, before you get to, like, what confidence? What kind of a stone is that? Um, the children of Israel, they had a daunting task. They had giants to conquer. They weren't just going to a land filled with milk and honey. And while they were, that was not just the only thing they had to do. They had to conquer giants. They had to conquer enemies. This is the same nation of Israel that back in the book of Numbers went out to spy out the land. And they were like, oh my gosh, this is daunting. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. We're not going to be able to do this. And Caleb and Joshua, the only two able to see the promised land, said, uh-uh, uh-uh, we can do this. With God on our side, we got this. And that's what I submit to you as you face your giants, your academic giants, for those of you on the um, Zoom call this morning that may be students, um, your academic giants, your, your involvement giants, all of the things that you're facing, you're being outnumbered in your classrooms. Those of us who are alums have experienced that on more than one or two or three or 10 occasions, and not just in the classroom, but in the workspace as well. Sometimes you may get in environments where it's daunting, where the giants seem too tough to defeat, but confidence in who you are, and most importantly, whose you are, and that you're on the Lord's side, and more importantly, he's on your side, that confidence can get you through to the other side of the River Jordan and place those stones in a place where people can look back and you can say, I did it, you can do it too. Now, the trick about confidence is not slipping into the, the area of arrogance, because my Bible readers will know if you go through Chronicles and Kings, the nation of Israel had its ups and its downs, and every time they forgot God, they suffered. And every time there was a king and leadership that said, we shall remember the Lord our God who brought us out of the land of Egypt, the nation flourished. So I submit to you, the God who is on your side, who brought you to this point, will lead you over on the other side of the River Jordan and your confidence can be a stone that says, this is what the Lord has done in my life. Another thing is the village around you. You can have confidence that there are people around you that are here to support you, you don't have to go into the, the promised land by yourself. Um, rely on those alums who've come before you, those peers who are with you. And then once you become an alum, same thing. Reach out to the, to the community of people who love you and are there to support you. Now, one of the things about that community of people who support you, they may not look like you. Um, in the book of Joshua chapter 2, Rahab was not of the nation of Israel, but she was instrumental in ensuring that they were able to successfully get into the promised land. So everybody who is going to help you build your confidence and help you over on the other side may not look like you. There will be advocates. There will be allies. Embrace them all and celebrate them all as they helped you build your confidence stone. And when others ask you, once you get those degrees and once you get that good job, and once you come back and serve in leadership capacities, like our dear friend Regina Sanders, the first African-American female, the first African-American and the second female to serve as the president of the Alumni Association, or Ms. Ada Ruth Huntley, who is serving as the first African-American female of SGA, and all of those other stones that have been set up, you can say with confidence, they did it, I can do it. And then you do it and you set your stone up. And then someone else can say, oh wow, whose stone is that? And then you can say, that's my stone. I have confidence in who I am and in whose I am. And at this time, I'll turn it over to my friend, Abraham Snell. Well, hello everyone. Uh, and let me again, echo all the thanks. Um, it, it is, uh, a, no small undertaking to put on something like this. And Aaron, you have, uh, you've shown out. 
and and I know you need like a two week break, <laughs> uh, and and your team, and so I'm I'm very thankful for all that you've done. I'm I'm thankful for all the folks that are currently in leadership at all people. You know, I don't know if, if Sonia and Nate feel this way, but people that we went to school with are now doing great things. And, and, and Sonia is actually one of those. And Nate is one of those people that I looked up to. They don't want me to say I looked up to them because they were a little ahead of, ahead of me. But I, I am I am I am in awe of what we have accomplished. But I am I am in, in anticipation of what we will accomplish. So today, as we talk about this idea of stones, um, I want to focus in on really what, what, what we're talking about here. And it's this word called legacy, legacy. And I'm going to share a definition with you. Legacy is basically anything handed down from the past as from an ancestor or predecessor. Anything handed down from the past as, as in, you know, anything. I mean, we talk about legacy in a lot of ways, and we're all products of legacy, and we're all producers of legacy. And get this, whether you want to be or not, whether you want to be or not, you are the product and the producer of legacy. Legacy can be a powerful force. It can change individual lives for the better or for the worse. Because, see, legacy is amoral until it's something is applied, motive, intent. Legacy can influence the outcomes of companies, churches, and yes, universities. Legacy can change the course of a nation. Legacy can be good or bad. Since we are virtually acting like we're in church, let me say it like they would say it in church. Legacy is generational, is a generational curse or it's a generational blessing. And here's the thing, you choose, you choose. Let me give you an example. Granddaddy had baby mamas all over the place. Now the son has baby mamas all over the place. Then the grandson had baby mamas all over the place. Why? Legacy, a generational curse. But somebody has to choose to say, I, I don't want to be a part of that legacy anymore. I am going to start a new legacy. So now we flip it. Grandfather had a business and he was, uh, he, he created his own wealth and he wanted to pass that to his children. Some said, okay, I'll do it. Some said they won't. But why did he want to pass it to his children? Legacy wanted children that be able to write their own ticket and make their own way. Now, listen, I'm not telling you what to choose or what not to choose. I'm just telling you that the power of legacy is very real. Legacy, when you are producing legacy, you have to think about some things. You have to think about what side of history do I want to be on? Because when you're dead and gone, Hundreds of years from now, somebody's going to look back on the legacy you left, and they're going to make a judgment. Now, I would say that there are a ton of folks during the Confederacy that thought that the legacy they would leave would ultimately lead to this nation continuing to be white, white-led. Um, I don't mean to offend. I'm just talking about the power of, of legacy. They, they probably felt strongly that they would be on the right side of history. But here we are hundreds of years later, and that legacy is beginning to be turned upside down. Now, I use that example because it's an example that you can look to um, and, and see the results. But I want you to think about the personal legacy in your life, the decisions you're making right now. 100 years from now, what do you want history to say about you? Do you want them to sing the song, Papa Was a Rolling Stone? Or do you want them to say, oh, my God, he built such a strong legacy for us. We all stand on the shoulder of a giant. What do you want your legacy to be? Legacy is passed down in a number of ways. Some are explicit. Some are implicit. For instance, and, and I want to give you two that's a good example, and then I'll tell you a quick story. So bigotry 
in its many forms. It's not just racial bigotry, bigotry, but against women, against you know, handicapped people, whatever. Bigotry in its many forms is normally explicitly passed down. In other words, people tell you they are not good people. They are good people. You don't fool with them, fool with them. We're better than them. You're better than them. That's explicit. That's, they tell you. But here is, here is another form of, of legacy that's, that's, that's more, it's really not insidious if it's good, but it's insidious if it's a bad legacy. Bias, for instance, is normally more implicit. In other words, we all have biases. Sometimes we don't even know why. We sometimes we have family biases and we don't know why. We 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 wonder why did grandmama and them not fool with her sister? Now, grandma and her sister might have had a falling out 50 years ago, something that does not impact you at all, but you don't fool with your great aunt's children because mom and them didn't fool with it. They never told you don't fool with them. They took you to the family reunion, but you knew there was something going on. And, and you just inherited that implicit bias. You have to be aware of that. And the way you're aware of that is to be honest with yourself. Now, my little story involves Dr. Gossett, who Nathaniel talked about earlier, who was the leader of Gospel Choir. <clears throat> he confronted me one time, and I got angry with him and didn't talk to him for two weeks, but he was right, so I had to go back and talk to him. And because and, he loved me. He talked to me one time about my inability to look white people in the eye. And, 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 I, and I was like, what are you talking about? And then he said, I know why you don't, because somebody, probably your grandfather, and it was my grandfather. I, my grandfather's a hero now, don't get me wrong. My grandfather deposited so many things into me. But one thing he deposited into me, he never said it, never told me. I noticed how he interacted with white people, because in his era, black men didn't look white people in the eye. And I inherited that. And Dr. Gossett told me that that's what I was doing. Oh, that pissed me off. I mean, made me mad. Sorry, we in church. I, listen, <laughs> I did not realize that I was doing that. But he did. And because he loved me and because he cared about me, he helped me. He said, you are a smart, you're going to be an engineer. He said, you can't be at the table not looking people in the eye because they take that as a sign of weakness or it, some kind of distrust. And I was angry with him for two weeks, but it changed my life and consequently my legacy. I am now able to do things because most of the time I'm the only one in the room, but now I'm able to do things with more confidence because that implicit bias that I would have never, I mean, that implicit legacy that I would have never known, someone as Sonia pointed out, was my ally. Someone came to my rescue and helped me change my legacy. So I'm going to kind of close it out with this because I know I'm over time, but, but legacy is preserved and extended by a lot of things, verbal and written records. The Hasidic Jews, you see them swaying from side to side. They're reciting scripture. And the Bible tells us that we should remember and recite scripture. Laws, procedures, like voting rights. So we have to have a Voting Rights Act to do something that the Constitution has already told us. The reason we have to do that is because of the legacy of racial bias in this country is stronger than the legacy of equality. So we have to keep working at it. Physical monuments, the stones that they talked about. Sometimes we need to remember legacy and, and monuments help us do that good and bad, because monuments influence social norms. Genetics, culture, mindset, I can go on and on. At the end of the day, this is what I want you to know. I want you to know that you are the product and the producer of legacy, but you get to choose. You get to choose whether you're going to continue a legacy. You get to choose whether you're going to leave a legacy and what that legacy is going to be. And as you leave a legacy, think about it. Make sure that your, your aims are noble and not selfish because 100 years from now, the story about you will be retold. How do you want it to be retold? That, that's it for me. 
Thank you, Abraham. That was wonderful, y'all. And I'm gonna roll right into it and continue with uh, that theme of legacy. Um, many of you may not know the story of Josetta Britton Matthews. She was our uh, first black graduate as well as our first black faculty member. Um, and so without further ado, we're gonna show this video. Hi, my name is Tyra Wilson and I am an Auburn alum and a member of Mosaic Theater Company. It is a privilege to introduce you to Dr. Josetta Britton Matthews, a pioneer of integration and excellence at Auburn University. Dr. Josetta Britton Matthews earned her undergraduate degree in French and political science from Indiana State University, which was a predominantly white institution. She then moved on to pursue her graduate degree, deciding to attend Auburn University's recently integrated campus. In reflection of her time on campus, she said that if she were to ever sit down at any of the War Eagle cafeteria tables, boy, everybody would get up and leave. Despite the unwelcoming social environment, she found a, co a community of peers who invited her to sit at their tables while she persevered in her studies and ultimately succeeded at Auburn University. Dr. Matthews graduated in 1966, 117 years after Auburn's founding as East Alabama Male College. With her master's degree, she moved on to influence young adult minds, teaching political science and, her, and French to students at Tuskegee University. She returned to her own educational pursuits in 1971, coming back to Auburn University for the doctoral program in social science and education. Dr. Josetta Matthews earned her doctorate in 1974 with a dissertation titled, The Image of American Negroes, 1960 to 1970, as reflected by issues in the Journal of Negro Education and Ebony Magazine. While earning her doctorate at Auburn, an esteemed peer brought her to the attention of his department head, as a potential history instructor. Almost a decade after becoming Auburn's first African-American graduate, Matthews became its first African-American faculty member, joining the School of Art and Sciences, now known as the College of Liberal Arts, as a history instructor. In reflection, Matthews stated, I had the potential of teaching black history because the black students wanted someone black to teach. The beauty in her story is that she took her experiences as a marginalized student at Auburn and put it to use uplifting other students walking a path similar to her own. She remained at Auburn as a mentor, using her passions and serving as a voice for sharing black history with young people. There was a need for representation and she set out to fill that void in the community. She knew how important it is for young black students to see a black woman taking up space in an academic setting teaching elements of the American historical narrative that their high school history courses wouldn't divulge. Her story teaches us to be resilient in the face of adversity, that representation in academic settings can change lives, and that we should use our voices to educate each other about the past in a hopes for an even brighter future. Dr. Matthews passed away December 15, 2019, leaving her legacy to resonate with the Auburn community and the lives of every peer and student she impacted. Her legacy lives on in the lives of black students, faculty, and alumni here at Auburn. With a spirit unafraid, she walked the corridors and concourses of Auburn University with her head held high. She rose above the glares and the whispers of her colleagues, opting instead to focus on creating environments that were dedicated to the studying and pursuit of black history and legacy. Many black women at Auburn here today still face those same struggles, being the object of the same glares and whispers as Josetta, as well as being the only ones in our classrooms asked to speak for our entire race. But also like Josetta, we continue to rise above. We earn our degrees walking across the stage confidently and then go back home to teach, lead, and advocate for the next generation to come behind. I know that as a black woman and as an alumni of Auburn University, it would not be possible for me to be here today without Dr. Josetta Matthews. I stand in the light of her legacy and it is a privilege and an honor to do so. Thank you.
So y'all, I don't know who um, knew that story already. I didn't know that story until this year um, when we uh, began digging up some history uh, about Auburn and our Black alumni and our, our legacy here at Auburn. Um, but I'm so glad that this has come out and I'm really thankful for the Mosaic Theater Company for doing these videos for us um, and then highlighting uh, these wonderful figures that we have. Um, so now I would like to just make the announcement if you have not heard, we have a Black Alumni Council. It's the inaugural council. Um, they were instated this, this September. Our first meeting was uh, the first week of September. And I'm so excited to be working with them to expand programs and services for our Black alumni. Um, and so at this moment, I will read out their names. A few of them are on this call. Um, and so if you would like to wave, um, please do so. Um, Courtney Bass, class of 2014. Anthony Britt, class of 2012. Jacoby Burns Johnson, class of 2001. Jasmine Carr, class of 2015. Keisha Zada, class of 2010. Sonia Jenkins, class of 1992. Linwood Moore, um, class of 1977. Christy Ogletree, class of 1988. Uh, Latricia Stone, class of 1995. And Erica Stringer Reeser, class of 2004. Um, so these Black alumni represent um, five states. Um, seven colleges and schools um, here in, at Auburn and their graduates from 1977 to 2019. Um, and these 10 members will serve a two-year term and we're very excited to get started um, on our programs and, and different things and we'll be sure to keep you all updated and ask any questions. Um, but at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Sonia um, so that she can say a few words about uh, being excited to serve. Well, thank you, Erin. Um... Gosh, Abraham, Abraham, that was a word. That was a word. So thank you for reiterating to us legacy, either being a product or a producer. I was taking notes, man. I was trying to on the slicky slide, still watch the camera, but take notes. That was a good word and thank you. And in that same vein, um, that, is, that is what we are praying and believing and trusting and serving to do on the Black Alumni Council is to establish a legacy um, it's, it's funny when Nathaniel mentioned the numbers of being fewer than 500 students back in the day, it kind of triggered. That was one of the things we had a, um, I don't know if you remember Drew Welch. She was one of our SARAs who worked in admissions and uh, she had us calling potential students recruiting, doing recruiting. And we were not at 500 when I was a freshman, sophomore and um, the, the, the sheer percentages just were, were daunting for, for the work that was ahead. And even today in 2020, the numbers, the percentages are daunting for the work ahead. But I, I'm so excited and pleased and honored to serve with the other nine members of this inaugural Black Alumni Council and excited, literally just on the edge of my seat, just waiting for what we are going to do together to make a difference with the alumni, the students, and all of the friends of color for the university. So um, keep the cards and letters coming, suggestions. We are, we are a representation of what is, you know, it's not our agenda, it's not our mission or vision, it's inaugural. So there is so much room to do so many things. So um, please reach out to any of the names that you heard called if they're in your class or if they're not, if you know them or if you don't, so we can together make things the way they should be. and. Um, make some progress for, for to leave a legacy for our future generations. Thanks, Aaron. I see Erica there. Would you like to say a few words? <laughs> look, look, I'm on call at the hospital for 14 days straight, so I'm, I'm tired now. <laughs> but I am super excited to um, uh, be a part of the Black Council and uh, to continue to hopefully lead the legacy. Um, my background um, is I'm a physician, a breast cancer uh, physician at University of Alabama at Birmingham. And uh, for this Black Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so every all you ladies, get your mammograms, you know, stay focused, get, uh, get screening. Um, and so um, I'm happy to be a representation, not only for um, the COSAM uh, department, but also for any uh, young uh, aspiring uh, undergrad that's looking to go into medicine, into research, um, as I have a, a focus in both. So 
again, very excited to be a part of the, the Black Council and I'm definitely open to hearing any suggestions that we can take back to the Bigger Alumni Association. Thank you, Erica. And I see Jacoby is here. Good morning, everybody. Um, like the others, Sonia and Erica, I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve on the Black Alumni Council. This is a chance for us to come together and support each other and also create the legacy that we've been talking about here today. So we are all open to suggestions, comments, but also concerns that you may have as we move forward. So we're not gonna be able to do this work alone. So it may be 10 of us on the council, but this is gonna require all of us to work together in sync collectively. So we are here to serve, we're here to lead, but we're also here to celebrate and empower each other. So we just look forward to the opportunities that lie ahead. And we just thank you for being here today and also this week. And just look forward to um, more to come from us, but we need your support. So thank you for the opportunity and we just look forward to working together with everyone. Thank you so much, Jacoby. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention Barbara Wallace Edwards, um, who was um, came before me um, starting Black Alumni Weekend. So Barbara, thank you so much for all that you did um, and in giving me the legacy to, to um, put my stone on. And without further ado, I will go ahead and um, do some. Oh, Barbara, would you like to say some words? I'm sorry. I was just to say thank you so much, Erin, um, and congratulations to you and the committee for the great job you've done this, this year and in past years as well. Um, you, you're carrying on that legacy very well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barbara. All right, now we're gonna get into our calls to action, uh, starting with Nathaniel Rutledge. Um, Nathaniel, take it away. Hey, everybody. Again, thank you so much for participating um, because our call to action is simple. Uh, if you love Auburn and you have a sense of duty and know that this is a calling on your life to have, have gone to Auburn, to have had that opportunity to be an influence, that you'll step out on faith and you'll continue to groom and grow the next generations and continue to help us be what we can be. You know, we have an Auburn creed, right? But every now and then, Nate kind of slips in and makes Nate's creed. I want to share my creed with you real quickly. And it's not a whole lot. It's just, I believe. I believe as an Auburn man, I should be an example. That everybody who knows I'm connected with Auburn should be able to look at me and realize that there's something good that came out. And because that did, I'm going to reach down and help somebody else to come up. I believe that I should lead others, that I should take the helm, go forward, try to make a tangible difference in the lives of everybody, to have an attitude that I know is crazy, but I believe I really can make a difference. I really think I can shape the lives of other people if I just try. And then while doing so, I must represent well. Because even though so many people will say I'm not a role model, but you know the truth, there's somebody somewhere all the time that wants to be just like you. There's somebody that's taken their lead to be like you. So whatever your call was, was well, on campus, you may have been an athlete. You may have sang in the Auburn University Gospel Choir. You may have been in COSAM, you may have been in engineering, you may have been in liberal arts. You have an opportunity to continue the legacy that Brother Snell has shared about, to continue the service and purpose that Sister Jenkins has shared about. And because Auburn men and women believe in these things, I believe in Auburn and love it. God bless you, God keep you, and that's my prayer. All right, Sonia. Since we are still in church, I'm going to lift a little bit of a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, so bear with me. 
Beginning at verse 20, it says, Now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. And that there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. My call to action, we need you. We need you. We need you. <laughs> we need you, your gifts, your talents. Maybe you're not the eye. Maybe you're the toenail, but we need you. Maybe you're not the wrist and you don't get to wear sparkly bracelets, but we need you. We are not a monolithic people. There's diversity on this call. There are so many backgrounds, so many talents, so many abilities. The university needs you. You may not sit at the table with the provost. You may not sit at the table with your dean, but there's something you can do. Don't aspire to be anyone else other than what you can be. Don't aspire to give anything other than what you can give. Again, you know, the, the body needs what you have to give. There are some parts of the Auburn family that are lacking because you're not involved. There are parts of the Auburn Black alumni family that is crippled or handicapped or, or there's a shortfall because you're not active. Again, don't measure yourself. Don't try to be the foot if you're supposed to be the hand. Don't try to be the ear if you're supposed to be the eye. Just contribute your part, whatever that is, your time, your talent, your treasure. We need you. That is my call to action, War Eagle. Um, Sonny, okay, you messed me up. So now I changed my whole charge now. Okay, just why you do me like that. First of all, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Abraham Snell. I am a graduate, uh, I'm a 1994 graduate, I'm a 1996 graduate, and I'm a 2009 graduate. So Auburn, I gave them a lot of money. So that's why I'm here, trying to influence the way they go, because I haven't paid my dues. So anyway, <laughs> moving on, a lot of money that I didn't have, had to borrow some of it. So, so Sonia changed my whole call to action because she, she started something and she needs to stop playing. Um, you are very, 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 very important. He created you for a purpose. In other words, there was a thing that was already there that needed you. And so you are a designer's original for that thing. And if you don't do it, that thing doesn't get done. Those people that are going to be influenced by you, who, who else does it do? He created you for that. And here's the thing. So often in today's society, we are selfish. But, but that is not God's original plan. Everything that you have is my stuff. Everything that I have is your stuff. I, I taught a lesson one time called Give Me My Stuff. Because you have my stuff. And, I, and the story that I used was the story of Elisha a prophet who did twice the number of things that Elijah did. And, and uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it was Elijah. And, and uh, that's another story for Elisha. It was Elijah who was running from somebody, a king, right? They were going to kill him. And he went to this place and his needs were being met. But then there was this widow, right, who had a need. But she couldn't get her need met unless Elisha came to help her. Now, yeah, it is Elisha. I'm sorry. So here's the thing about Elisha. He did twice the number of things of Elijah, but he couldn't heal himself. Elisha died of a sickness. And in fact, the anointing on him for others was so strong that when they, when they opened up his tomb and threw some other dead bodies on his bones, those dead bodies came to life. 
even in death, he was still operating in his gift, but he couldn't save himself because the stuff that he had wasn't for him. The widow woman, on the other hand, had some stuff, some oil that she couldn't activate, but she had bills that would do, and a son that was about to be sold into slavery. She needed him to come over there, and with whatever gifting he had to make the oil continue to flow so she could sell it and make a profit, she needed him for that. In the same way, and I can't tell the story fully because it's too, you know, too long, but in the same way, there are needs that are going on right now at Auburn University that God made you custom made to answer, to fulfill. Me too, me too. This call to action is not just to y'all, it's to me. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be involved in? Just because, and, and I know some people, some graduates had a bad experience at Auburn for whatever reason. But do I want to just leave and, and worry about me and my experience, or do I want to make that experience better for somebody else? Do I want to use that thing that God custom designed me for, for his purpose, or do I just want to worry about me and how it benefits me? So to Sonia's point, not only do we need you, you were built for this. You were built for this. You have to discover it. I can't tell you what it is, but the people that benefit from it will know because they will tell you, oh girl, if you hadn't shown up or guy, if you hadn't have been there, there were people and things that are custom built for the thing that they're supposed to do. Now you got to go out and discover it. So my call to action is do the thing that you were purposed to do as it relates to Auburn University, as it relates to the rest of your life too, but definitely as it relates to Auburn University. Okay, Aaron, I'm, I'm done. Good. Thank y'all so much. There, I mean, these are great messages. Um, I think about, you know, working here now and, and all the things that have come uh, from me being back at Auburn um, with the help of you all as alumni participating in programs and, and the events that we're doing and continuing to grow. And I'm just looking forward to the future, especially with the, the folks on the Black Alumni Council and all their ideas and, and what you're going to be able to suggest to us to, to execute. I'm super excited about the future. Um, I have a couple of really uh, easy call to actions. Um, you know, we have current students on our campus that don't really know a lot about our, about our Auburn alumni. We have about 11,000 Black graduates um, that, I mean, have, are doing so many wonderful things, and so we have an opportunity for you to tell your story. Um, and so that's on our website, and I'm actually going to drop the link in the chat for you to tell your story. We have a lot of uh, great alumni that have already told theirs. Um, you can add um, whatever you'd like to say um, to our alums and our students, and then you can add pictures as well um, in this way that people can come to our website and really peruse through and see um, all of our alumni and what they're doing now. Um, also, another piece of our legacy, as we know, is uh, Dr. Harold Franklin, and he recently was able to successfully defend his, grad, um, his degree, um, his thesis, sorry, um, and he graduated in 2020. So he obviously didn't get the opportunity to walk across the stage, but we still want to celebrate him um, in a major way. And so if you would like to, and this link here um, is to, to give your congratulations and, and your thanks to Dr. Franklin for opening the doors for us to attend Auburn University. And then uh, we would like to put those together in, in a really nice way um, and send those to him so that he can have um, at his home. Um, but without further ado, I think uh, we're going to wrap up the first virtual Black Alumni Week. I um, can't believe we did it. So thank you all for attending all the events. And, and I really appreciate each and every one of you. And um, War Eagle, have a great day. <laughs>